Hello everyone and welcome back to Ways of the World, a brief global history with sources. As we begin our study of Chapter 8, China and the World, East Asian Connections, 600 to 1300. And we're going to start with, together again, the reemergence of a unified China. So I'd like to start with this image here called Chinese Astronomy. The impressive achievements of the Chinese astronomy included the observation of sunspots, supernova, and solar and lunar eclipses, as well as the construction of elaborate star maps and astronomical devices such as those shown here. The print itself is of uh, excuse me, Japanese origin and depicts a figure wearing the dragon robes of a Chinese official. It illustrates the immense cultural influence of China on its smaller Japanese neighbor. All right, a golden age of Chinese achievement. The Sui Dynasty, 589 to 618, reunified China. Sui rulers vastly extended the canal system, but their ruthlessness and failure to conquer Korea alienated people and exhausted the state's resources. And the dynasty was overthrown, but the state didn't disintegrate. The Tang took over in 618 and lasted until 907, and the Sung Dynasty came in 960 and lasted until 1279. And they built on the same Sui foundations. They established patterns of Chinese life that lasted all the way into the 20th century. And this is regarded as a golden age, age of arts and literature. Now let's talk about the Tang and Sung politics. There are six major ministries that were created along with the censorate for surveillance over the government. There's an examination system that revived to staff the bureaucracy. This is the civil service exam um, that we've already learned about. There's a proliferation of schools and colleges and a large share of official positions ultimately went to sons of the elite. No large landowners continued to be powerful despite state efforts to, redistrib excuse me, to redistribute land to the peasants. Now, there's an economic evolu uh, revolution under the Sung Dynasty. It's great prosperity, rapid population growth from approximately 50 million to 60 million during the Tang Dynasty to about 120 million by the year 1200. And there's great improvement in agricultural production. China was the most urbanized region in the world by far. Um, great improvements were made in industrial production. And we also see the invention of print, both woodblock and movable type. And they uh, also developed the best navigational and shipbuilding technology in the world, also the invention of gunpowder. Now, the production for the market rather than for local consumption was widespread during this time. There's a cheap transportation that allowed peasants to grow specialized crops, and the government demanded payment of taxes in cash not in kind. And there's a growing use of paper money and financial uh, instruments during this time in China. All right, the Tang and Sung Dynasty China. During the third wave era, China interacted extensively with its neighbors. The Tang Dynasty extended Chinese control deep into Central Asia. Under the Sung Dynasty, nomadic Jurchen peoples conquered much of northern China, creating two states the Song in the south and the Jin in the north. Both claim to be the heirs to the Tang Dynasty and thus the true emperors of China. Let's compare the extent of Tang Dynasty China to that of the Southern Song Dynasty China. Which major regions did the Tang, excuse me, Tang control that the Southern Song did not? Unlike the Song, the Tang Dynasty reached farther north past the Yellow River and farther west into the Tarim Basin. All right, a fifth century Chinese Buddhist painting depicting demons armed with a fire lance and grenade. So the Chinese Tang and Sung dynasties witnessed a golden age of technological innovation in China. As mentioned before, both woodblock, excuse me, woodblock and movable type generated the world's first printed books, while Chinese innovations in navigational shipbuilding technologies led the world. Among these many developments, we see the invention of gunpowder 
And that stands out because it spawned a permanent revolution in military affairs that had global dimensions. But gunpowder, a mixture of saltpeter, sulfur, and charcoal, was not originally developed for use in war. Instead, it was an accidental byproduct of the search of, uh, by Taoist ar- alchemists for an elixir of immortality. Indeed, the first reference to gunpowder appeared in the mid-9th century Taoist text that warns alchemists not to mix together its component parts because smoke and flames result so that the alchemist's hands and faces have been burnt and even the whole house where they were working burned down. This association with alchemy may explain why the Chinese referred to gunpowder as huoyang or fire drug. The same properties that made gunpowder so dangerous in an alchemist's lab attracted the interests of those seeking to entertain and amaze audiences through fireworks and pyrotechnic displays, especially at the Chinese imperial court. All right, this detail comes from a huge watercolor scroll titled Upper River, Ch- uh, excuse me, Upper River During Qing Ming Festival, originally painted during the Song Dynasty. It illustrates the urban sophistication of Kaifeng and other Chinese cities at that time and has pre, uh, excuse me, frequently imitated and been copied since. All right, women in the Song Dynasty. This era wasn't very, quote-unquote, golden for women. During the Tang Dynasty, elite women in the North had been allowed greater freedom, um, and that's due to an influence of the steppe nomads. However, the Song tightened their patriarchal restrictions on women. Literature highlighted the subjugation of women. Foot binding started in the 10th or 11th century CE and was associated with images of female beauty and eroticism, but it kept women restricted to the house. Textile production became larger scale, displacing women from their traditional role in the industry. Women found other roles in cities, and prosperity of the elite created demand for concubines, entertainers, courtesans, and prostitutes. In some ways, the position of women improved. Property rights did expand, and more women were educated in order to raise better sons. All right, foot binding. While the practice of foot binding painfully deformed the feet of young girls and women, it also associated aesthetically with uh, feminine beauty, particularly in the delicate and elaborately decorated shoes that encased their bound feet. So how does the Chinese practice of foot binding demonstrate the tightening of patriarchy under Neo-Confucianism? The practice of foot binding was associated with ideas about female beauty that emphasized small size, frailty, and deference. It limited a woman's woman's ability to move around, which would keep her restricted to the home and subservient to and relevant, or excuse me, reliant on men. And this concludes our study of Together Again, the Reemergence of a Unified China. I will see you guys next time.